I invite you to open your copy of God's Word to Matthew chapter 10. We're going to be wrapping up Matthew chapter 10 this morning, the second extended teaching of Jesus in the book of Matthew, the first one being the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 10 being the second one. And we are, of course, continuing through our series where we're finding Jesus to be the unexpected, authoritative, and compassionate king. Now, as we open this morning, I, I'd like to ask, and maybe you can tell me your stories afterwards, but do any of the guys in the room have an interesting story of when you asked permission to marry your wife? Anybody have an interesting story like that that I need to hear? Okay, if a few of us do. We're shyly raising our hands. Uh, I, re I remember when I asked my now father-in-law, Leon, if I could marry Autumn. And uh, we were home in Waver at Autumn's parents' house in Waverly, and I knew I was going golfing uh, with her dad. And so I was like, all right, when we go golfing, I'm going to do it. I'm going to ask the question. And I really had no reason to fear for all reasons that it was probably going to be a go-ahead. He's not going to turn me down. Uh, but there's just something about asking that question that uh, makes, you, uh, makes you think about it. It uh, makes your heart go a little faster. And uh, guess which hole I ended up asking him? 19, 19 yeah. Uh, when, when we were walking off the 18th green. Oh, by the way, I've been nervous about this the whole 18 holes, and that's why I've been playing so bad. Uh, can I marry your daughter? And uh, of course he said yes, and here we are. Uh, that is uh, just an interesting thing, uh, to ask permission to marry somebody. Uh, I want to share a story that I came across in one of my, some of my reading this week of uh, a young man, uh, I'm not going to pronounce his name, but Mr. Judson. You might know of the Judson, they are considered pioneer missionaries. And before he left to go to the mission field, he asked permission of his first wife, Anne was her name. He asked her father permission through a letter to marry him, or to, mar to be able to marry her. And I wanted to read this letter for you this morning. And for the dads in the room, if you've been on the other side of that, you've received the question, just imagine this being the way it was asked. He writes, I have now to ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring to see her no more in this world. Whether you can consent to her departure and her subjection to the hardships and sufferings of missionary life. Whether you can consent to her exposure to the dangers of the ocean, to the fatal influence of the southern climate of India, to every kind of want and distress, to degradation, to insult, persecution, and perhaps even a violent death. Can you consent to all of this for the sake of him who left his heavenly home and died for her and for you. For the sake of perishing immortal souls. For the sake of Zion and the glory of God, can you consent to all of this? In hope of soon meeting your daughter in the world of glory with a crown of righteousness brightened with the acclamations of praise which shall renown to her Savior from heathens saved through her means from eternal woe and despair. Imagine receiving that letter. I have three daughters, and I'm a pastor, so I should say, yes, I consent to all of that. But that's hard to say yes to. The challenge we're going to look at this morning is not primarily about what you would let your kids do for Jesus, although that actually is going to appear in our text. The question this morning is, what about you? Would you yourself consent to all of that? 
The question for us this morning is, who are you loving the most? Who are you living for the most? Are you all in for Christ? Does your life really belong to God? Have you laid your life at his feet and said, use me however you see fit? Can you really echo the words of Isaiah in chapter 6 of his book where he sees the holiness and glory of God and his response is, Lord, here am I, send me. Is God in the driver's seat or have you simply invited him along for the ride? Our text this morning is Matthew 10, 34 to 42. We're going to look at priorities of the mission. We're going to talk about living for Jesus and loving Jesus above all else. And the big idea this morning is that God wants you to love him and live for him above all else. If you haven't been with us the last couple of weeks, it might be helpful to get the context of where these verses come. And so this is where we've been working our way through Matthew chapter 10. We've talked about having hearts for the harvest. Christ says the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. There's good news and there's bad news. The response to that is, first of all, pray that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. And then this, the second thing is he actually says go. And he sends out these apostles as ambassadors for the mission. In the first four verses of chapter 10, we saw the people that he chose to send on this mission. Odd choice for these 12 guys, but he chooses them nonetheless. He also sends them not just on their own, but he gives them power. Power to heal. Power over demons and disease. Then we saw the instructions for the mission in verses 5 through 15, where he says specifically, where are you guys to go? Okay, this was, these were specific instructions for specific people in a specific time, if I can say that word enough. And then in the next section, verses 16 through 24, Jesus' teaching here kind of expands beyond just the initial apostles and that initial mission to to be true of all followers of Christ, and that is the expectation for the mission, which is persecution is par for the course. If you're going to claim the name of Christ and live a life that resembles that claim, you will face opposition. And that message was actually kind of depressing, and I'm glad it didn't stop there because we then had encouragement for the mission. That's what we looked at last week when we had this passage where Christ tells them, do not fear. Do not fear for this reason, this reason, and this reason. Truth always prevails. They really can't touch your soul, and God cares for you. He is your sovereign, caring Lord. And so this morning, we look at the priorities for the mission. And as we do that, we're going to look at two questions that this text will challenge us with. So before we dive in, let's pray together. Lord, we want your help this morning. We need your help this morning. As we open up your word and look at your truth, we invite your word and your spirit to have their way within us. Lord, it's my prayer that we would receive with meekness your holy word. May it be you and not me who we learn more of this morning in Jesus' name. We'll dive into verses 34 and following by first looking at the first question. The first question is, will you give your love to Jesus? Will you give your love to Jesus? Look look with me at verse 34. Jesus says, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but rather a sword. An interesting statement from our Lord Jesus. He says, he starts this section off by saying, do not assume that I have just come to bring peace and that everything's going to be all good. 
but rather you need to understand that I have brought a sword. And when we first read this, we automatically, or if you're like me, you automatically think, wait a minute. Wasn't Jesus prophesied in Isaiah to be the coming prince of peace? Wonderful counselor, everlasting God, almighty father, prince of peace. Isn't it true that when he was born in Luke chapter 2, the angels proclaimed glory to God in the highest and peace on earth, goodwill to men? Is it not true that Romans 5.1 says, being justified by faith we, faith, we have peace with God? Is it also not true in Ephesians 2 verse 14 and following where it says he is our peace, he breaks down walls of hostility Reconciling us, being brought near by the blood of Christ, is it not true in Philippians 4, verse 7, when it describes a peace of God which passes understanding that will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus and many others? Many other passages that we could go to that boldly proclaim God as being a God of peace, Christ as being that Prince of Peace. How then can Christ say, do not assume that I have come to bring peace, but rather I have come to bring a sword? Well, the reality is God's word has also told us about this sword that he's bringing. You know, we, we're familiar with the verses that promise peace because we want that peace. And by God's grace, many of us have experienced and are experiencing that peace of God. But there's other passages like Isaiah 8, verse 14, which says, Christ will be a stone that causes men to stumble, a rock that makes them fall. 1 Corinthians 1, 23 and following says, We preach Christ crucified. Unto Jews he's a stumbling block, and unto Gentiles he is foolishness. And so as we start examining the word of God more closely, what we see is this peace that Christ brings is available to all, but the reality is not everybody will receive it. In fact, there will be many who reject Christ and this peace that he has to offer. The reality is those who do not respond positively to Christ, those who do not accept him as their Lord and Savior, will not participate in this peace that he brings, and they also will not respond kindly to those who have it, to those who claim the name of Christ. He goes on in verses 35 and 36. He says this, I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against his mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person, person's enemies will be those of his own household. Enemies in your own home. It breaks my heart that even some within our own congregation have experienced this reality personally. But this is what happens when some are so adamantly opposed to the truth of Christ, and meanwhile, you are claiming his name and not shying away from it. Verse 37 is, is where we get the challenge, who will you love more? Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. As a parent, you understand the depth of love that you have for your children. It's hard to imagine a love that is greater than that. And yet, here Jesus is saying, we as parents must love him more than our kids. And as children, you must love him more than your parents. Who will you love more? Kids, And by the way, we're all kids, okay? This can be young children. This can be adult children. Will you choose God first or will you choose your parents first? 
The Bible's full of passages that tell us we need to honor our father and mother. We need to obey our parents in the Lord for this is right. That's one of my favorite verses. But depending on your situation and what your parents are like, you may need to choose to follow God instead of them. It could be as simple as conversion. In some countries, for a child to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior would mean they would be thought of as dead to their families. In fact, even in small town Pella, Iowa, when I was in youth group, we had uh, a young lady who was going through that same dilemma. Her family was of another religion, and she had come to a place where she believed in Christ as her Savior, and she had to choose, is this going to be something that I'm going to hide forever, or is this something that I'm going to tell my parents about and risk losing everything? Eventually, her love for Jesus was more than her love for them. And, and thankfully, in that situation, her parents responded graciously, but that's not always the case. It could be as simple as conversion. It could be a lot more complicated. Maybe you're, you're doing your best to follow the Lord and follow his will, and your parents are like, eh, not sure about that. Are you sure you want to be a pastor? Are you sure you want to be a missionary? Are you sure you want to go into this field or that field? Whether it's kids to parents or parents to kids, this command does not mean that in order to love God more than our family, we need to lessen the amount that we love and honor our families. That's not the answer that he's going for here. We don't lessen the amount that we love our families. Rather, we increase the amount that we love our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the reality is that the more we elevate our love for God and Christ, the more our love for others and family will also rise with the tide. If you think about it the other way, we talked about kids to parents, but how about parents to kids? You might be given ultimatums. Either denounce your love for Christ and all of the truth that you hold or you don't get time with us. Which will you choose? Perhaps this might look like putting kids even above your marriage which should represent the gospel and therefore also putting your kids above God. Perhaps as we think about parents to kids, we can ask, what is your greatest concern for your children? Is it that they would know, love, and follow Jesus? Do you want them to glorify God and enjoy him forever? If it's anything else, you might want to think about that seriously. And if you would say, yes, my primary chief concern for them is that they glorify God and enjoy him forever. If so, does the way that you manage your time, your energy, and your money reflect that? You see, the answer is not decrease the amount that we love our families. The, the answer is increase the amount that we love God. This is true. As, I mean, I think of being a, being a dad and being a husband. The best way for me to love my family is to first love God. The more that I love God and pursue Christ, the more he will have his way in my heart and my life and transform me from the inside out so that my pride will slowly fade away. My selfishness will subtly subdue itself. My anger will lessen. I will listen better. I will want to serve others more. I will be quicker to forgive. I will be more eager to give grace. I will have this mind which is available to me through Christ Jesus to do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others as more significant than myself. And I'm far from that, but if I want to love my kids and love my family more than I love myself, 
that I need to love God first. You know, sometimes it's easy for us to, to think, I, I need to do this and do this and do this better. And we make ourselves a, a long laundry list of ways that we need to be better or do better. And what ends up happening is we fail. Why? Because it's up to me to do these things. When in reality, the answer needs to be, let me go to Christ. He is my only hope in life and death. He is the only way. And yet these first several verses here ask us a tough question. Will you give your love to Jesus first? The second question comes in verses 38 and 39. Will you give your life to Jesus? So don't just give your love to Jesus. We, we need to give everything to him. It says this, a person's, sorry, verse 38. Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And so this question is really asked in, in those two different verses. The first verse says, take up your cross. What does it mean to take up your cross? Well, it's not to wear a cross necklace. It's not to have a cross bumper sticker. It's not to get a tattoo of a verse. Okay, that's all fine and dandy, but that's not what it means to, to take up your cross. Sometimes we, we talk about carrying our cross or taking up our cross as if it's our burden to bear in this lifetime. It's a specific hardship, or we might think it's an illness or difficult relationship, financial difficulties, insecurities, or some other type of ongoing suffering. That's not what we're talking about here when we say, take up your cross. It's, it's not this burden that you have to bear, necessarily. It's not also how, somehow identifying ourselves with the cross of Christ. Because, after all, Christ had not died yet as he's giving these instructions, and he says, he doesn't say, take my cross, he says, take your cross. And so what does it mean to take up your cross? Well, what would the apostles have known of the cross? They would have known it as an instrument of death. To pick up your cross means to pick up the instrument of your death and walk often while listening to those who want you dead, yelling at you and mocking you until you reach the destination where your life will come to an excruciatingly painful end. The cross is a symbol of death long before Christ died on it. And so to carry your cross is to lay down your life. To carry your cross is to die to yourself. To say, no more of me. A helpful verse is, is actually a parallel passage in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. It says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. And I love this because that phrase, take up your cross, is sandwiched in between these phrases, deny yourself and follow me. To take up your cross is to say, no more of me, but all of Christ. That's what it means to take up your cross. This particular verse also says to do that daily. And so this isn't necessarily just a one-time decision. This, this is a daily moment-by-moment -moment choice that says less of me, more of him. The cross is a symbol of death. You can't rightly say that you would be willing to die for Christ if you aren't first willing to live for him. I think a lot of people would say, yes, if, if I had a gun to my head, I would, I would proclaim the name of Christ, and yet in your daily life, you're not living it out. If you would truly be willing to die for him, you would also be willing to live for him. Will you give your life to Jesus? Take up your cross. The second verse, verse 39, encourages us to cling to Christ rather than trying to control our own lives. He says, whoever finds his life will lose it. 
but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Here we might find help from, once again, in the Gospel of John 12, verse 25. Jesus says, those who love their life in this world will end up losing it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will end up keeping it for eternity. He's comparing the now to eternity. I like that the NLT translation of Matthew chapter 10, verse 39 says it this way. It says, if you cling to your life, you'll end up losing it. But if you give it up to Christ, then you will find it. The question is, are we going to prioritize now or prioritize eternity? Prioritize you or prioritize Christ? Create your perfect little kingdom here on earth or gladly receive the kingdom of God? Where is your citizenship? Where are you building your home? Will you give your life to Jesus, or will you cling on to your life? Will you try to control it? Will your, will your knuckles be white because you're trying so hard to control this, that, and the other? Because if you could just make this one thing happen, then life would be better. This verse says the tighter you cling, the more you will lose. And the more you give to him, the more you will gain. Will you give your life to Christ? I wonder if there is some area of your life that you are clinging tightly to and you need to surrender to him. He goes on in verses 40 to 42, to talk about some rewards for those who receive him. It says, whoever receives you receives me. Whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. Whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly, truly, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. This admittedly is a kind of tricky couple of verses. There's a lot of different ideas about what it means, but I think the main point of these verses can be found right in that first verse. Verse 40, he says, Whoever receives you receives me. Whoever receives him me receives him who sent me. If you remember back earlier in the, God, in the chapter 10 of Matthew, when he's initially sending the apostles out, he gives them specific instructions. He says, if the house that you go to is worthy, let your peace be upon it. If it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet and leave. Essentially condemn them. Wipe the dust off of your feet and leave. And so as we think about these last couple of verses, he's essentially saying those who receive you as you go out are receiving you because they're receiving your message. If they receive your message, that means they're receiving Jesus as king. If they're receiving Jesus as king, they're receiving the Father who sent him. And they will have their reward. Priorities for the mission. These questions are tough. These are questions that some days I answer these questions and I'm thinking, yeah, I'm, I'm doing okay. Other days I answer these questions and I, ha I have to admit I am utterly failing. And so what's the answer for us? Well, we have to go to the cross. We have to go to the gospel. The answer cannot be, okay, I need to do better and start making our big list of things we need to do, like we just said, doesn't work. Don't get me wrong. We, there, there, there's an aspect where we need to discipline ourselves towards godliness, but the growth will not come because of our own strength or our own ability. We have to constantly return to the gospel. We can love. Why? Because he first loved us. 
We have life because he gave life to us. Both physically and spiritually, he is the creator and sustainer, the author and perfecter of our faith. And so we can't just think harder or think more. We can't just make ourselves or will ourselves to be better. Our salvation and our sanctification or our growth are because of God's grace. We need to run to the foot of the cross daily and feast upon the goodness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We need to saturate and renew our minds with this truth. We need to encourage our hearts by his love. We need to depend on his spirit to transform us and guide us. We need to do the hard work of asking the Lord to remove the idols which are clamoring for the attention of our hearts, to remove the competition fighting for our love, to let go of control of our own lives and give it wholly and completely to him. Give your love to Jesus. Give your life to Jesus. We started with the missionary story. I'm going to end with the missionary story. Many of you are familiar with Jim Elliott. He's a missionary to Ecuador. He was killed in an attempt to bring the gospel where it had not yet gone. One of the most famous missionary quotes you'll ever hear is from Jim Elliott, who died giving his life fully to Christ. And, And let me be clear. Giving your life fully to Christ doesn't mean that you are a missionary and you die on the mission field. That's not the standard. But he said this, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot lose. What is he saying? He's putting Matthew chapter 10, verse 39 into his own words. If you try to to cling on to this life, build your own little kingdom, have everything here and now, you're going to lose it. It's going to burn. It won't last. But if you give that up in comparison to your love and commitment and devotion and submitment to Christ, then you will gain something that you cannot lose. It cannot be taken away. And so this morning, I would encourage you to not be a fool. Where are your priorities? Are you loving and living for Jesus? In just a moment, we're going to sing a closing song called I Surrender All. I'd like to take this song as an opportunity for you to respond to what God is doing. Is that the song? Okay, something close to that. Something, no? Okay. Anyways, regardless of what the song is, this is an opportunity for us to respond. Is there something that is not surrendered to Christ? I'd encourage you to use this time to, to sing those songs. If you can sing, the, sing, the, sing this song with the words and mean it, Sing along. If you, if you can't say with 100% of your heart this morning that you have surrendered all, I would encourage you to take this time and, and pray. Do business with God. Maybe Come find me in the back. Fill out a connection card so somebody we can connect you with somebody this week who can pray with you and help you to take that next step in your relationship with God. Will you pray with me? Dear God, what a, what a joy to be able to dive into your word and to look at Matthew chapter 10, this, this extended portion of teaching from Jesus to the apostles and then, and then further to everyone who will follow after him. Lord, there's lots of things that are competing for our love and our life. And we just pray this morning that we would be a people who are committed to daily picking up our cross, meaning daily laying ourselves down and saying yes to you. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name.